In 1969, a group of astronauts changed the world. They walked on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In 1972, our journey ended. We've never been back. 2010 begins a year of change. Private companies are working on next generation spaceships. Governments are looking to go back to the moon and on to Mars. It's time to look up and dream again. It's time to push humans into the cosmos. It's time to educate and engage the planet. It's time for Space Vidcast. Space Vidcast 327 for Friday the 13th of August. Dum dum dum. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me as always is the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham. We are your Space Vidcasters as usual. We have got an action-packed epic episode for you tonight. You know, one of the things that not a lot of people think of uh, during the Apollo missions was all of the video that they have. Right. When, you, when we first stepped foot on the moon, there was live television albeit slow scan live television, but there was live television from the moon. And tonight we've got Dwight, help me with the name. Really? Oh yeah, I, I did it in pre-show and I got it right and I know I'm going to screw it up right now. So. It's Dwight Stephen Bolnetsky. There you, Bolnetsky. Exactly. Uh, we've got uh, the author of Live TV from the Moon, Dwight, joining us uh, uh, live via Skype. Dwight, wel welcome to Space Vidcast. <laughs> Hello, it's great to be here. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for having me on the show at 3 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're overseas. You're, you're not in the States, which is weird for us. So what we're going to do, we're going to keep you up as late as humanly possible. Oh, yeah. And see how punchy you get. It's going to be great. Oh, I'm a shift worker. I can handle it. <laughs> so let's start at the beginning. Um, you know, we all just kind of assume television was going to be on the Apollo missions because it's a historic event. you got to broadcast it. But that's not actually the case. They had to fight for that. So let's start uh, even pre-Apollo. How did that? What was the whole story behind them getting cameras on the spacecraft? The, the original idea for for using television on uh, on the Apollo missions, the planned Apollo missions, while it was still uh, uh, not um, uh, the the rendezvous. Oh, you got me on this. I've, I've forgotten the terminology. I'm so nervous. Um, they were going to use it as the guidance system for uh, f for landing the actual rocket on the moon. Uh, basically, the astronauts were going to be lying back, looking at a TV monitor, and the cameras would be facing towards the lunar surface, and they would, could then roughly land uh, where they were supposed to land. And that's what they originally planned the cameras for. Then they started to think, well, the Russians... Uh, sent back the, the the far side of the moon and NASA started to think well maybe it's a good idea that we we telecast what we're doing up in space so that the general public the taxpayers who have financed the 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 space um, space industry at that time uh, there was not that much private uh, space uh, exploration going on it was all handled by NASA subcontract obviously out to other companies but the taxpayer essentially paid for the moon missions. So that's why they, they ended up deciding to develop or research television systems. The, uh, the problem being there were two camps within NASA, like the, the P, the Public Affairs Office, knew exactly that it was such a, uh, a publicity um, stunt, really, to, to have television that they were all for it. There were the engineers on the other side, most of them, that were saying, this is uh, uh, added weight, we don't need it, it puts the astronauts in danger because instead of looking at one of the controls on the, on the, on the rocket control panel, they were, they were goofing around with a camera. So let's talk about the added size and weight because I remember back when I was doing TV, um, we'll, we'll say not that long ago, but in realist, realistically a while ago, um, I remember using an old tube camera. And, and that's essentially the technology we're talking about. We're not talking about 
you know, CCDs that capture light. We're talking about old tubes that convert light into electricity. And this was a, you know, the camera I worked on was a three tube camera. It was very fragile, very sensitive. You couldn't point it at bright objects. It was very large. I mean, it was like, it was large and it was heavy. This thing, and these are all things that you do not want on a space mission. You don't want something very fragile, very large, and very heavy. Those are pretty much the three things you have to say no to. And so they basically had to invent something completely new in order to be able to just get the approval to bring this thing to the moon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, this, uh, the discussion, yes, no, yes, no, that went up basically until a couple of weeks before Apollo 11 launched, if you can believe that. They had the cameras, everything was developed, it was tested, it was fully flight tested, but there was still the, the contingency that said, uh, no, it's not worth having because of the weight and the uh, hassle it gives to the uh, to the astronauts while they're walking on the surface of the moon. And you just you look at it today and you think, how short-sighted is that? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and uh, coming back to the the, uh, the size of things, right? That is a high-definition camera that I own. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 1080i uh, high-resolution mode. Look at the size of that thing. Now, I have something very interesting. It's not actually a flight uh, camera, uh, um, piece of equipment. Sorry, I keep, uh, as I live in Germany, trying to speak English sometimes, I think, what the hell is the English word again? <laughs> <laughs> that is a, well, let me move that into frame. That is a single tube from an Earth-based three tube camera that was at the launch facility in Cape Canaveral, right? So you can get an idea of the size of the cameras in those days. That's just for a, a standard definition video of the rocket being flung up into the air, uh, into the sky from, from the launch pad. So and that's just they the had tube. To... That's not right. even that's the whole camera. Tube. That's just, just the tube. tube. That's just the part that converts light into an electrical impulse. Exactly. Well, exactly. Oh yeah. So well, in this the... case, only one of the tubes. You needed three, one for each part of the light spectrum, red, green, and blue. Yeah. Plus, somebody had to sit there and register that the the yep. colors would all match, so uh, you'd have a, a decent looking picture. And then you think the guys at Westinghouse and RCA, they were tasked with building a system that would convert you know, the, the studio cameras uh, that you see on the old, I don't know, Beatles clips. You know, sometimes when they get the camera operator in the shot, you just see this big monster monstrous thing and you go well, <laughs> what the hell is that uh looks like a cannon uh and they had they were thinking they were thinking about actually putting one of those things on the lunar module at one point and it was just like no <laughs> <laughs> so and how they, do they, they had the what was the progression then how did they get from that big monstrosity to something that you, they could actually and did bring to the moon the uh there was a tube, the Vidicon camera, uh, the, video, the Vidicon tube that RCA had developed, which was well suited for smaller cameras. They had developed that for mainly uh, outside broadcasts or a portable scenario, portable in the 60s terms. Um, they then, uh, RCA was tasked to build the small compact black and white slow scan camera, single tube black and white, which is what you saw on Apollo 7 and Apollo 8 that uh, it was small enough to, to be taken on board and it was easy enough that they, uh, the astronauts didn't have to do any settings other than turn it on and turn it off and point it in the right direction. And if you watch the, the telecast from Apollo 8, there is a sequence where they've got the Earth in shot. Now, the, the guys in the spacecraft could not see the Earth but they were getting commu uh, commands from Houston telling them, <laughs> move, move slightly to the left, to the right. And while I was doing the research, I thought, okay, they must have just been you know, turning it in the window. What actually was happening? Frank Borman was spinning the spacecraft in the direction to get the Earth in shot because <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they didn't have a viewfinder. They couldn't see what they were doing. Nice. So, uh, you know, and I just want to point this out. Chapter 6, your book, and I think this is a... This is a chapter fantastic six. read. I love this. I'm a video geek, too, so I was just, like, enthralled. But chapter 6 starts with the quote from Frank Borman, and I quote, uh, yeah, you grab, are you grabbing a copy to see what I'm about to read? Um, it was two years ago I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I, I saw that. It's, I just busted out laughing, and this just goes back to the challenges of getting, just, just getting the cameras there. He said, 
I didn't want to take the damn television camera with me. So it wasn't just a technical problem. The astronauts didn't even want to use the silly things. Well, uh, there's also the, the, the quote from the chapter before from Wally Shara that he, the Apollo 1 crew were his friends, his close friends, and they're saying, take this uh, additional piece of electronic equipment that can arc any time and uh, turn it on, please. And he's like, no. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of pressure from within the television industry, uh, CBS, NBC, ABC, to get a camera on there. And somebody uh, in, in Washington actually applied the pressure onto NASA and said, look, you've got to have this. The people have paid for these missions. They have a right to see what's going on. These days, if we look at it, it's over 40 years ago from the first uh, live telecast from Apollo 7, that you just think, who decided that it was a stupid idea to take those things? This is what we rely on these days to get an idea of what the missions were like. If we didn't have that video, it would be like, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> sort of, a similar sort of frustrating thing, uh, although we've got the 16 millimetre footage, when they landed on Apollo 11, we didn't see the pictures as they landed. We only heard the audio. Well, I didn't. I was only a baby at the time, but my parents heard the audio. Um, there was a plan to televise the landing as well, but they didn't, they didn't have the bandwidth and they couldn't get a stable lock on the signal, so they, they abandoned that idea. But uh, it, there was, again, there was the side that said we should televise everything, and there was the side that said, no, we actually shouldn't really televise anything. Hmm. And, well, and they ended up kind of halfway in between uh, where they, they televised what they could. Right. Yeah, exactly. The, the most important stuff, which is the moonwalks, uh, mm -hmm. were televised from the point up until Apollo 16 as they came down the ladder. And from that point on with Apollo 16, they, uh, they were delayed landing on the moon because of a, a problem with the command module. And the uh, Omni antenna, if I remember correctly, on the command module was out of commission or, or faulty. So that they decided to abandon... Uh, the, uh, the low gain antenna and just use it once it was mounted on the lunar rover, which was then the remote control camera and completely uh, commanded from, from Houston. Now you're talking about antennas, so let's segue into some of the technical problems that come into the bandwidth required to transmit video. Uh, back in the day we had NTSC uh, video and um, that requires a pretty good chunk of bandwidth in order to, to, to work and yep. the camp of there's no way in hell we're going to do video we only do things that are mission critical, basically said the video from this is going to hog all of our available bandwidth. All of mm -hmm. our analog signals are going to go into the video. And so they had to create interesting ways to get around that to ensure that they weren't hogging the entire, entire spectrum. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Okay. The, uh, if you look at the Apollo 11 or anything prior to Apollo 11, except for Apollo 10, which was in color. It's a very jumpy movement, and that is because they were transmitting at 10 frames a second, whereas normal video, when you watch just a television program, is 30 frames a second. So what they essentially did is they cut out two thirds of the, the bandwidth of moving pictures, to st what it was they still considered acceptable movement depiction. They cut out color, so that was another, I don't know how many percent uh, of, of the, the bandwidth. And uh, that way they, they solved the problem of, of how much signal they could send, but then the, the problem became, that's not compatible with home television sets, what do we do now? Then there was a, a contract awarded to RCA to build a scan converter, which would convert those slow scan black and white images into compatible NTSC images and that it involved a method of having a camera pointed a high resolution camera pointed at a high resolution monitor using a disk recorder system it would take one frame of the 10 frames coming down in the meanwhile while the next frame which was skipping then the uh, the, the missing pieces would then be replayed from the disk recorder and combine to make the 30 frames a second, if that makes any sense yes. <laughs> without pictures. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, my understanding is that they were considering trying to do digital back in the day, which we're talking the 60s, right? Yeah, late 50s, right, early 50s, 60s. 50s, early 60s, yep. they and they were going to try and do digital? Digital, digital transmission. The camera itself was still an analog camera, but the, uh, the uplinking or the downlinking from the spacecraft was then going to be digital. 
they did a uh, series of tests using uh, f pictures, television pictures, and they were degraded via the, the compression and the rest of it. And uh, they, up until I'd say mid-65, it still had a good chance of flying as, as a digital system. Uh, it, they turned around at the end of it and said, look, the power needed to, to send the signal is too, too excessive, analog is better. So that, that is how they ended up with analog television. Now, we've got some pictures that you sent over uh, prior to the show, and we've got a couple videos. Uh, should, we, should we start with the video, or should we start with the pictures, do you think? Show the video. That's got uh, a gentleman who uh, I couldn't have finished the project without. That's uh, Stan Labar, who passed away December 20, well, 24th Australian time. It was the 23rd of December in, uh, in the United States, and I had logged on to wish him happy holidays. Uh, I had spoken with him over the course of five years. You know, I had a question, colour converter, you know, rada rada ra, can you please tell me what happened on that particular day? And this guy had everything and he would write back to me and he, uh, he was so behind this project because his story or the story of the guys behind the TV images had never been told. And uh, he, was, he always said to me, you know, you've, in, in my case, for example, if, if you mention to me orbital mechanics, I'll look at you like Homer Simpson and go, ooh, yes, I understand that. Not at all. You mentioned, do you remember where you were when the television signal came from Apollo 11? Everybody goes, yeah, I remember. I was sitting here. I was doing this. I was da 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 there was never it was never told how did these signals get get to people at home mm -hmm. uh, so he was he was just uh, over the moon <laughs> um, <laughs> to, to know that somebody had actually put his life's passion he was so passionate about his work uh, you know I'd call him up ask him a question f uh, that I, I expected a five minute answer and we would be on the phone for three hours he would tell me every little piece of information connected with that one question. And then he would say, oh, look, I don't know this answer. Talk to this fellow. And I'd read the report and it'd be some guy that you'd never heard of. And he was still, you know, alive and kicking. Uh, and you'd send off an email and then that guy would obviously then do the same thing, you know, 10-page dossier on, on his part in, uh, in uh, developing the cable that connected to the back of the camera. It was just amazing, amazing story. It. And it's just, it really, it breaks my heart that he, he didn't live to see, uh, to see the finished product. He's read a, a rough draft of the manuscript that uh, he, didn't, he didn't get to see it, but uh, I, I definitely know his widow and his family uh, 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 just ecstatic about it. And that, that actually means more to me than anything else, that I, I did a good job in their eyes of portraying the, the, the work of, of their father and right. husband. And this clip is, um, he's talking about the camera, I believe, the, the one that they're sending to the moon. Yes. All right, yes. here you go. Bit of silence at the beginning. For the first time, man is about to set foot on the moon's surface. This is the television camera that will record that historic event. You will see it live on your home television set. I'm Stan Labar, Westinghouse Program Manager for Apollo Television Cameras. The public is probably most familiar with this color television camera that was used by astronaut Tom Stafford on Apollo 10. And this is the camera that took those extraordinary color pictures of both the Earth and the Moon. This is the mini monitor that enabled the astronaut to view the scenes within the spacecraft as you saw it on your home television screen. Incidentally, this color camera will be used in the command module on Apollo 11. But the world attention will be focused on this small black and white camera that will be located in the lens, and it will record the astronaut as he descends to the lunar surface and takes those first monumental steps. You know, it's, it's amazing to, to look at really how small those were, uh, you know, and back in the day, I mean, today we take it for granted, but back in the day, it's, I mean, that's just unheard of. That, that really was space age technology then.
Oh, it certainly was. It certainly was. I, that, it, not only did it uh, provide television from the moon, it, it catapulted uh, electronic news gathering years ahead into the into the future. That had the, the moon missions not happened, cameras probably would have stayed the bulky things they were up until the mid seventies, I would imagine. Uh, and thanks to the development of the guys at Westinghouse and RCA, we, televisions, you know, just <laughs> exponentially sh shrank. Uh, to, to the point, you know, in, in 19, uh, 1974, you had a domestic camera about that size. Now, today you look at it and go, oh, my God. But uh, back then, that was a big, uh, you know, a big deal to have small cameras like that. And none of that, none of that domestic stuff would have happened uh, had it not been for those, those engineers that just uh, had a vision for the future. So talk to me a little bit about slow scan versus NTSC again. Um, I, I understand that they had the, the different uh, sections across the planet, the different uh, receiving stations, that were able to take the slow scan and, as you mentioned, convert it to NTSC. Um, yes. But when we saw the Apollo 11 footage, um, it looked really nasty bad. I mean, it, it was like, blur it's blurry, it's, not, it's just not good. Why? Okay, the, uh, the clip of Stan comes from a website called honeysucklecreek.net, which you saw at the end of the, the clip, run by Colin McKellar. And he was part of uh, the team that was trying to find the original telemetry tapes. And the reason they were searching for these tapes is because Stan LeBar was watching the, the downlinked footage and thinking, when we were doing the tests in, uh, in, in the Westinghouse facility, the television never looked that bad. What's going on here? And through a bit of research, they figured out that uh, the original, the, the second the camera was turned on, that signal came through Goldstone Tracking Station. And there was a new engineer on the uh, scan converter. He forgot to set the switch to invert the image. The camera was mounted in the lunar module upside down when they opened the Mesa, the uh, modular equipment storage assembly. So they had to flip the, the signal to, to make it look right side up or, or roughly right side up for the people watching at home. Uh, he panicked, thinking the white sky was actually the Earth. So he started adjusting the controls, <laughs> bringing the, crushing all the blacks, like bringing the, the luminance of the image right down, and sat there and went, uh, oh, my God, I can't turn this back up. I don't know what I'm going to do. And in, in the meantime, uh, Honeysuckle Creek, who was also receiving the signal, said, look, we've got this image that looks fine. Uh, uh, shall we give it to you? And Houston then said, yeah, okay, we'll take it from you. And so they switched over to Australia. Now, the thing that you guys didn't know, and I am so privileged to come from probably the greatest country in the world, we had the better looking images telecast on our television sets. You guys didn't. <laughs> so, but it's because still... that was not, sorry. So, so what have they, but they never, there were two inch tapes that were lost, right? I mean, they've, they've never found That's... those tapes. There were two sets of tapes. There was the t uh, there were the telemetry tapes, which were one inch and would store 15 minutes of telemetry data, which included that slow scan information. And the idea was, we find these tapes, we put them on a machine, and we extrapolate the television image again, but digitally reconstruct it into 30 frames a second, and therefore don't have any of the analog conversion pointing. When you, if you point a TV camera at a, at a television screen. You will get an image, but it's already degraded. You can see it straight away. You've, it's not as good as if you just converted from tape to tape or, or whatever. Uh, there was also an experimental recording system in parks that was not actually officialized by anybody. They just had it running in the background to see if it would work. And that was to record it on two inch. Now, as, as far as uh, they could work out, the one inch tapes were reused for data probably from the Pioneer 10 probe. The two-inch tapes were taken and uh, never heard from again, probably being held ransom somewhere. And that's unfortunately the point it got to. They did find uh, in the CBS archives scan converted television that was the best looking of the lot. And they combined the television signal from Sydney video, which had the Honeysuckle Creek footage that I was telling you about the, the we Australians got to see and nobody else. Um, <laughs> and they integrated that then with the better looking CBS footage and they sent all that stuff over to Larry Digital, which are the people that restore movies like Star Wars, Indiana Jones, mm -hmm. James Bond, bringing them looking like they're about ready to, to be thrown into the bin to looking like, wow, it just looks like it was filmed yesterday. 
and they have reduced the noise, brought the levels back into into uh, a very very nice looking. Uh, set of video which actually I'm, I, when I look at the kinescopes which were 16 millimeter film filmed off a TV set of video filmed off a TV set you can, you know, it, it's no wonder the stuff looks horrendous mm -hmm. whereas this stuff is as close to the original as they could find you know it, it would have been nice had they had they been able to find the, the telemetry tapes but you, know, you can you can live in hope uh Let's go all the way back to the beginning one more time, because I like to jump around in timelines for no apparent reason. Uh, Apollo was not the first time they brought a camera up into space. It confuses me. <laughs> I know. You thought this was a linear show? Please. <laughs> yes. I wrote that, did I? Uh, you're talking about the Mercury flight of Faith 7. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was an experimental video camera that... Uh, I, I only myself discovered watching Mark Gray's uh, DVD sets. I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Gray, who brings out uh, the, the Apollo footage from start to finish, spacecraft films. And he brought out the, uh, the Mercury set, which had this section on slow scan TV. I'm like, what the hell? So I'm looking at this thing going, OK, somebody took a camera up with them. What the hell happened here? Did a bit of research, and it turned out they did they did send slow scan, and this is really slow, slow scan, one frame every three seconds, or thereabouts. Uh, but they they did extrapolate some some decent looking footage. The only trouble is it uh, was such a pain in the neck for um, for Gord, Gordon Cooper to to use the system that he came back and just said, "Nah, forget it. Terrible, terrible." And Partly that reason is why they didn't decide to have any uh, television on the Gemini flights because the spacecraft was so cramped. It's like, oh, no, no, we are not putting that stuff in the control panel. And, it, you know, it took, it took, I think, 20 minutes for him to, to set the camera up. If he wanted to take a, a bit of footage out of the window, it was, it was such a, a procedure that they just decided to forget it. So we know you have a TV background and... Obviously, you are a little bit of a space nut, given I'm looking at the background that you, you know, the bookcase or the DVD case that you're sitting in front of with all of the other models and whatnot. Post-show material right there. It, oh, for sure. But how did you get started in telling this story specifically? How did I get started? It was basically, I, I, was, I was interested in the footage, and the first time I saw the complete Apollo 11 EVA was in 1989 when I was living in San Diego. I, I was lucky enough to get an internship with a cable TV company down there. And you know, we had every single channel available to us, and the arts and entertainment had as it happened. And they rebroadcast the original footage at the time it happened 20 years earlier. And I'm like, I want to see that. So I recorded that stuff uh, completely illegally on a, on a Betamax system. Yes, <laughs> uh, which means you can play it over and over and over again at your leisure. I, look, I tell you, I, I converted the stuff about a year ago over to DVD, finally after another 20 <laughs> years, and I was like, well, you know, Betamax was not a bad format. Um, anyway, so and then I had the Apollo 11 stuff, and I loved watching it. It was so inspiring for me. If I had a bad day, put that stuff on, and the normal people would either drink booze or take drugs. So I sit there and watch Apollo 11, and, and <laughs> I was always like, well, what about the other missions? You know, well, how come I can't see stuff? And every time they'd have an anniversary or some special, even NASA themselves, I'd go, here's some highlights from the footage. I'd be like, <laughs> you'd see sort of like a flash of, of Apollo 14, and that would be it. <laughs> and yeah. it, it's either, either Alan Shepard hitting the golf ball or the 16 millimeter film of when they're putting the camera up, and that's it. Or and obviously the lunar module uh, launching, which you have in your opener, as you pointed out to me. <laughs> we, and to show off your nerdery, and I just I'm sorry. Yes, to show off your total nerdery um, for I, you know I just remembered it being Apollo 17 because you know I figured if I'm going to put anything in the open and we're talking about the end, we put Apollo 17 in there. You, the moment you see it. Um, I don't even remember what it was, but you you, you were like, nope, that's Apollo. That's not 17 uh, that, at all. That's 15 or whatever it was. I'm like, <laughs> no, you're wrong. And I scrub through it. I don't see the zoom. It doesn't tilt up. I'm like, oh, oh. dang it. <laughs> so two points you. Yeah, well, aren't you glad I'm on the show? You know. <laughs> which speaking uh, speaking of which, there was the, the, the coming back to sort of really cool like footage that, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is some of the best looking stuff. I can watch that stuff over and over. You think, my God, here is a camera being um, steered by a guy in Houston with a 1.5 second delay from the second he pushes the button tilt up 
for the camera to tilt up, right? He's seeing what he's doing with a three second delay because it's got to come back to him. <laughs> and this lunar module, two people, the, uh, only two living beings on the moon taking off and there's this camera following them. You know, and you get the conspiracists going, <laughs> Did they leave somebody still on the moon to, to videotape? You know, read the documentation, you know. It's all, it's all in the book, actually. Now you can... <laughs> twenty nine ninety five from uh, all selected bookstores. <laughs> well, it, that's just it. He did a, such a fantastic job of that because it's not, just, it's not just that you have to tilt the camera up, but the, the tilt-up had to follow the vehicle. And when you watch the Apollo 17 uh, uh, ascent, it's... It's amazing. It's it, it, beautiful. It, he, like you see the quick zoom out, like oh god, we gotta zoom out. <laughs> and then and then it just it just right up with the vehicle, and you know that was impressive. Very that, cool. But that wasn't the first time he tried to do that. He tried to do that twice before, correct? On yes, on Apollo 15, and that's how I, I knew that that uh, bit of footage wasn't the Apollo 17 because the uh, the clutch system that would tilt the camera up and down was defective by the end of the. Uh, the Apollo 15 mission, uh, EVA, sorry, not mission, uh, due to lunar dust. So that they decided, okay, we're not going to take any chances. We're just going to leave the camera on its fixed setting. We can turn left and right. We can pan, but we can't tilt up and we can zoom out. So they decided just leave it and the thing goes out of shot. Within three seconds, that's it. You just see the, uh, the descent stage still sitting on the lunar surface, but you can't see the, the thing going up. On Apollo 16, they parked too close to the lunar module. Everything was worked out mathematically that if I park rover here, lunar module lift off at time X, we follow, it stays in frame. Of course, they parked too close, so there's uh, Ed Fendel who was controlling the camera, pushing the button to go up, and the thing just flew off in the... <laughs> The lunar module's off in one direction and the camera's pointing in another direction and you see black sky with a bit of dust. It's like, wow. But he, <laughs> he, did, he did manage. And think about this. Think about this. He had a three-second delay watching what he's doing because then the mathematics is to hell with that. You know, I'm just going to find this thing. So he's got <laughs> zoom in, zoom out, pan up, pan, pan, pan down, turn left and right. And that they managed to, he managed to find the lunar module again, just briefly. You see it sort of pan by, and, but like you imagine with three second delays, like, ah, there it is. <laughs> By the time he pushes the button, the thing's already uh, orbiting the moon. <laughs> so that he was adamant. He was adamant on Apollo 17, park the damn rover there and make sure you park it there. And I'm going to hassle you until you tell me you've parked it there because I want this to work. And it did. Thank goodness for that. You know, that would make a great, like, iPhone game, the, uh, the uh, iPhone lunar, <laughs> lunar Video Commander, where every, it's like, it's like a, you have to, you know, do whatever action you do, but you have to wait three seconds before you can see what you just did. Yes. <laughs> just, to, just to feel their pain at that point. Exactly. Uh, well, actually, when I was more... in... Go ahead. Sorry? Now, when I was in San Diego, we used to telecast uh, the most exciting things you could ever imagine, council meetings, and I would go for five hours straight. And we did the whole thing on remote control cameras. And, of course, the, these bulky cameras would take half a second to sort of gear up to, to do the movement. So uh, it, people say, oh, it's impossible to follow. You, go, you get a, a knack for it, actually. You push the button, you just go, OK, I know that I've got to push it three seconds beforehand. You get this instinct of astronaut's going to move right, so I better start panning now because I figure he's either going to go left or right. So 50-50, zoom out, you've got your, your bases covered. Dwight, where can people get more information about you online? Right, I have a website, www.livetvfromthemoon.com, all one word, except for the dots. Then I have... Uh... Really? <laughs> except for the dots, do I? Really? Except for the dots, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what an age we live in, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, why did I wake up at 4 o'clock? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You've also got your book, uh, Live TV from the Moon, which is available through apogeebooks.com, and you, you can pick that up right now today. All one word except for the dots. All one word except for the dots. Uh, and we're going to give away a free... Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's going to be a new thing on the show. You've started a new uh, meme, a oh. Space Cast meme. Congratulations on that one. Uh, and we're going to give away a free copy of the book in just a moment to one of our faithful Space Vidcast tweeps. Uh, tweet Can I enter? Absolutely. Dwight, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's god-awful scary early in the morning for you, but if you don't mind, hang around just a little bit longer. We want to know what's all behind you. You've got some pretty interesting rockets that the chat room was bringing up before. And in the post show, which will be available on Space Vidcast Epic, I'd love for you to kind of give us a quick tour of what's going on back behind you there. 
OK, that means I'm going to have to change the shorts I've got on. You know, the standard thing, uh, newsreaders <laughs> don't actually wear <laughs> long pants. I just have uh, shorts on. So, yeah, so I'll be happy to do that in post-show. <laughs> <laughs> in post-show, exactly. Dwight, thanks for joining us. For everyone else, if you'd like to see that, make sure you sign up for Space Vidcast Epic Access. You can do that at spacevidcast.com slash epic. Again, you can get live TV from the moon from our good friends over at apogeebooks.com. It is an awesome read, especially for a TV geek like me. I'm like, awesome! Awesome. So it's pretty cool. It's a good read anyway, in case you're interested for someone like me who doesn't get into all of the tubes and tops and bits and bytes. Bits and bytes. Put your finger somewhere on the screen. Right there. A geek mom, congratulations, you've won another book. <laughs> you know, do we give it to her? She just went one not that long ago. She you just went. She, you know, she's a faithful viewer. We're gonna give it to her. There you go. Yeah, that's that's how that goes. That's Although, much like her other book, she won't get it for two weeks. Exactly, exactly. All right, I'd like to thank everyone for watching us, and you'd think that after last week's little snafu in mispronouncing Dwight's name, I would have had uh, this week. Oh. Um, you know this one, though. I really? Do. Yep. You want to introduce our next week's guest? No, go ahead. This, no, no, this is all you, because this is a pretty cool one, and you got the last one. Do we still have those books signed? I think I... We might have a signed copy of next week's guest. We might have a signed copy of the guest. <laughs> Next week's guest. Hell yes! yes! That would be awesome! I'm going to sign myself and give me away next week. Andrew Chaikin, uh, who is <laughs> the author of many books about, many, the, many. about the Apollo program. And my, interestingly enough, my favorite book from him, and this is going to sound absolutely terrible, and I don't mean it that way, uh, it's like a pretty much a photography book. Right, it's just a, it's a picture book. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a picture book. Andrew once uh, well says one or two things, but basically it's just a bunch of pictures. pictures. Uh, it is it is absolutely amazing. So he'll be joining us uh, next week on Space Vidcast. And the following week, we will either... What? You didn't want to mention what next week is? Haircut week? No, not haircut week. It's our 100th show! Bing, bing, bing! Anyone? Bing, 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 bing. This is show 99. That makes next week's show 100. <laughs> so Dwight, you're oh almost God. as cool as Andrew. Almost. So Actually, close. this was supposed to be our 100th show. Um, and Ben and then, screwed up the math. Yeah, and then and then Dwight was on. I'm like, no, no, we can't do that. What? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I don't know why I'm giving our. He's like, hang up Skype. I'm not doing post show with those well, fools anymore. Well, he's probably changing. He's probably actually <laughs> he's way not from listening. the cube. He won't even know until he watches after the fact. He's gonna be like, I don't like them. <laughs> Um, all right, on that note, uh, the following week we're going to be in Washington, D.C. Why are we going to be in Washington, D.C.? Because Washington, D.C. is awesome Why? and it happens to have a space up. Boom! Q. I promised last week that we'd make an epic, awesome, epic, epicness open for Space Up DC. And we did. And wop, bam, boom. There you go. We did. A little Battlestar theme kind of. A little like, bit a little with bit the of drums kind of feel, kind of boom, boom, boom. And, the... and that's how Space Up DC is going to be. Hell it is yeah. the. It is going to be an epic, awesome conference of ep unconference of epic epicness. And uh, we're going to be there. Hopefully, you'll be there as well. Don't make excuses. You can find a way to make it to Space Up DC. If you can't be there, we're going to try to stream as much of it live as we can. <laughs> now, for those who don't know, every pod that we stream takes one megabit. Yes. <laughs> so, But that's... we are at a university campus, so that, that should help. We should. <laughs> But again, yes, uh, no promises. Who knows there. what's going to happen? Because last time we tried to do that, we took down the entire network. It's pretty awesome. The whole thing. No one could use it, even us. We just crashed the whole thing. That's good stuff. Hopefully, we won't do that again. Uh, they don't just need big tubes, they need big Wi Fi's, because apparently we've only been given Wi Fi access. And I wi -Fi, need them with the big GBs. Wi Fi plus video usually doesn't work. So, all right. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you next week. In nineteen sixty nine, it has changed. They want, they want, they want, they want, they want.
In 1970, our journey, 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 our